All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, this presentation is called Red Team Techniques for Evading, Bypassing, and Disabling Microsoft Advanced Threat Protection and Advanced Threat Analytics. So this picture, um, I'm from Canada, and I, I always love this picture. This is from the IBM uh, Toronto Downtown Data Center from 1963, but um, it's, now it's actually a sushi restaurant. So uh, I'm Rep Bandit. I'm the Red Teaming Ops Lead for uh, X-Force Red. Um, part of uh, the Crest board for Crest USA, and I like being in Europe because Crest actually means something here where nobody's heard of it in North America. Um, um, I, uh, I conduct red teaming operations against defense contractors and some of North America's largest banks, so I don't actually do red teaming of IBM but for IBM. Um, so why this talk on Microsoft Advanced Analytics and Advanced Threat Protection? Well, when you're testing really mature companies, I've come against some really good uh, de uh, defensive strategies and detection strategies at clients. Um, they've integrated tools like Sysmon uh, and AppLocker and AMET, and they're using Windows Event Log forwarding. They've Im implemented products like CrowdStrike and Silence for host behavior analytics, products like Rapid7 user insights for domain behavior analytics. And I spent a lot of time um, figuring out how to bypass or evade them as a whole. And when I saw that Microsoft was coming out with both host and domain-based uh, behavior analytics tools, and that ATP, or Advanced Threat Protection, was actually built into Windows 10 itself, uh, I knew this was an area that, as attackers, uh, we needed to spend uh, a lot more time on, especially since um, both products are, are actually in the process of being integrated to, uh, under the, the Advanced Threat Protection um, brand. So I gave uh, an original version of this talk back at DEF CON, um, which is the first talk on ATP and the second on ATA, as, as Nikhil had done a talk on ATA like a day before mine. Um, but since then, I've upgraded and heavily revised this talk because new versions have come out. So they fixed a lot of the bypasses that I found back then, so I've had to find more. Um, but there's probably a lot of techniques I haven't tested uh, or found um, or didn't think of, so hopefully it inspires you to get you know, familiar with these tools yourself. So to set the stage, um, when I developed IBM X-Force Red's uh, TTPs or, or tactic, tech, <laughs> tactics, techniques, and procedures for red teaming, I put a huge uh, emphasis on host recon and internal recon being two very distinct phases, um, which we'll go into why in a bit. But as, um, as red teamers, when we're operating against really mature blue teams, we need to gain a solid understanding of what indicators of compromise our tools and techniques are leaving behind, what commands might be caught by script logging, what's flaggable in Sysmon, and importantly, how we can learn to use techniques that avoid user behavior analytics because machine learning's you know, coming down the pipes and a lot of companies are going to be implementing better uh, behavior analytics than what's been out there in the past. So here's a quick overview of Advanced Threat Protection or Windows Defender Advanced Threat Protection. Uh, it's currently active on uh, more than 2 million devices. I think most of those are, are at Microsoft itself. Um, but this is the cloud ATP dashboard that the sensors report into. Uh, it's very similar to other dashboards you've seen out there for products like CrowdStrike. Um, the difference with ATP is, like I mentioned, it's actually embedded into Windows 10 Enterprise. So there's, there's no real, um, you know, it's not hard to, to activate and install this uh, on a Windows 10 desktop because it's already installed. It's just a matter of running a quick script to activate the functionality. Um, release 3 recently came bundled with the Windows 10 1709 or uh, Fall Creators or Autumn Update uh, for you in the UK. Um, so it, it, it came bundled on, uh, I believe, October 17th uh, for the latest version, and then the next version is going to be coming out in the spring. Um, so these sensors that are embedded in Windows 10, they collect um, behavioral s signals from the box, like processes that are running, uh, changes to the registry, file changes, network communications, and they send all this sensor data to the cloud. And then uh, Microsoft's intelligent security graph uh, applies behavioral learning to it um, to, to analyze the data that's coming from all these different sensors. 
So as of uh, last month's Vault Creators update, um, the Windows Defender brand was uh, expanded to include not only the traditional Windows Defender that we all love and hate, uh, it's now Defender ATP, uh, Defender Exploit Guard, which was previously Emit, if you've ever used that, uh, Application Guard, Device Guard, Credential Guard, and it's actually been expanded to start to cover uh, Windows Server 2012 R2 and 2016. It's also been um, expanded to work with uh, other products to, uh, that are running on Linux. So it can take any uh, behavioral data from other third party products and, and crunch that in the cloud as well. Uh, and then deep integration with advanced threat analytics, the other product we'll be talking about today is coming uh, in the fall, or sorry, in the spring of next year. So here's the release three dashboard I mentioned. If, if we look in the bottom right corner, we'll see the entire new Windows 10 security stack all reporting into a single dashboard. And this is interesting from a attacker's perspective because before all of this data was just mostly sitting on the box. Uh, we didn't have to worry about somebody forwarding it off the box. We didn't worry about emit um, alerting on us, but now it's all easily reporting into the blue team. Um, so it makes adoption of uh, you know a, a better defensive strategy a lot easier for these these blue teams. And then in release four, um, just quickly, this is what's coming in the spring. So auto remediation. So it's going to use um, Windows Firewall and uh, the exploit guard and app guard and all these different security uh, tools in the security stack to block uh, threats across the enterprise. So it detects an attack on one, it's going to automatically say apply firewall rules to block C2 uh, for any malware to all endpoints. So uh, let's actually look at ATP and play. Um, here's uh, with just a basic launcher download cradle from PowerShell Empire or Cobalt Strike. You can see it's encoded. Um, it's going to detect that pretty easily. Um, it's also going to detect really heavy, heavy, heavily obfuscated PowerShell commands uh, and ones that we generate ourselves using, say, the Obfuscated Empire project. Um, this particular one was a custom cradle from Cobalt Strike with a reverse DNS payload. Um, and the reason they can detect this, so, so Microsoft gave us a really amazing framework with PowerShell as attackers. Um, we've been favoring using PowerShell EXE, PowerShell EXE, the PowerShell core, and the underlying Windows management framework for several years because of its flexibility and ease of use. So we've been using awesome tools that have come out that leverage PowerShell, like PowerShell Empire, PowerUp, uh, Unmanaged PowerShell, Not PowerShell, PowerSploit, Nishang. Uh, Power View, User Hunter, and Bloodhound. So a lot of you guys will be familiar with those tools. But once we had got all our tools um, focused on PowerShell, then Microsoft implemented all of this logging uh, and all these different security um, features within PowerShell to kind of take our new shiny tools away um, by uh, implementing all these new security um, improvements. So what are some of these improvements? If we look at with the Windows Management Framework or, or PowerShell version 5, uh, it includes script block logging, transaction and transcription logging. It flags on suspicious strings like dash E and C. Um, it can implement constrained language mode and it contains just enough administration support. Um, as attackers, most people have been avoiding PowerShell version 5 by just calling PowerShell version 2, which didn't have any of this, and that was installed by default. So even if defenders had upgraded and installed PowerShell version 5 in the past, PowerShell version 2 remained installed even unless they specifically uninstall it. But in Windows uh, 10, 17.09, or the Fall Creators update, they've removed support for PowerShell version 2 altogether. So you can't install it if you wanted to as an attacker. Um, they've, they've put in, um, we'll talk about that in a minute. They've put in uh, ways to not only detect PowerShell um, malicious commands, but also uh, Windows scripting host, uh, VBScript, and JavaScript uh, based attacks. 
Um, if you try to use tools like Ben 10's uh, not PowerShell, which basically is just a, a front end wrapper to talk to the back end Windows management framework, that's also going to be caught because the commands still need to be sent to the back end Windows management framework version 5. And we've seen bypasses for a lot of these, like uh, Cobber's PS AMPC tool or different COM techniques, but red teamers really need to streamline and chain all those bypasses together to actually get code execution on the box, get a reverse shell, and start to run commands all without being detected. So that's actually um, pretty difficult to do. So as a result of these improvements, we really need to go back to living off the land, um, selectively running PowerShell only after we're confident that we've disabled ATP and other next-gen um, antivirus products. Uh, the, the real um, powerhouse uh, security, um, I'd say, technology that Microsoft has put out lately is AMPSI, or the anti-malware scanning interface. And this is the reason that everything's being caught. Um, because before, um, so MC basically hooks the Windows scripting host. Um, so before an interpreter runs these malicious co commands, everything is deobfuscated, everything's in plain text, um, and it's going to catch dynamic Java, VBScript, and PowerShell code before it's executed and it's run before run through the Windows Defender. Um, there's an article um, that was just put out two days ago. If you want to have a look more into MC. Uh, it's also pretty good at detecting uh, using sign binaries to launch malicious executables um, based on abnormal behavior, like connecting to uh, a recently registered domain or connecting out to Tor, um, using VBScript within a macro-enabled document, for example. Um, and you can see based on some of these alert examples that many of the initial execution, execution host recon and privilege escalation activities are going to be flagged due to the underlying techniques used. But um, so you can get on a box initially undetected using, say, PowerShell Empire, but the name of the game is to not get caught so early. So instead, we want to use um, basically, uh, we want to use un unobfuscated JavaScript or VBScript payloads that don't have kernel 32 API declarations in them. Uh, we want to use signed execs to load um, payloads like Cobalt Strike, Stageless, uh, DNS. Uh, payload. Uh, and then we want to, you know, whenever possible, use things like uh, Veil and Ebola and Shelter to key our malware whenever possible and encrypt it. Um, and so some, some techniques uh, with, or some payloads created with Veil won't be detected. Um, but now that we're on the box, the challenge doesn't um, stop uh, when we get on the box undetected initially. That's the easy part. The problem is detection of activities that we perform after we get on the box. So tools and commands that we're running, uh, like creating a new process or doing host recon in environmental settings or local groups. Um, maybe we want to attempt to bypass host controls like AppLocker and Emit and UAC and PowerShell constrained language mode and AMPSI and whatnot. Um, we want to perform privilege escalation to go from a regular user to admin on the box. So all of these are, are uh, commands that we have to worry about getting detected on. So as red teamers, a lot of these will, will look pretty familiar to you. Um, they're just host recon, host information gathering. A lot of those are going to be flagged by ATP because um, that's pretty suspicious that a regular user is running those commands. Um, but not detected is the Windows management interface. Uh, or WMI. Uh, we can run uh, the WMI command line, WMIC, uh, or we can run um, the, we can call the underlying WMI schema directly using different classes like we see at the bottom there. So in release four in the spring, uh, allegedly they're, they're coming out with a lot of improved WMI detections, but um, we'll, we'll see how they do with that. But right now, WMI is your best bet. Um, also, if you directly call Windows APIs um, and really return to living off the land, we can call Windows APIs through raw sockets with Meterpreter, such as the Metasploit post module that use Windows APIs via Railgun. Um, we can use Cobalt Strike. Uh, a number of Cobalt Strike mo modules are API only. Um, but before you run uh, these commands, 
you want to make sure they actually are making just local calls and they aren't a combination of local calls and network calls like uh, local admin search enum. Um, another uh, interesting way I saw that, that was um, we could get on a box, but not only get on a box, we could even as a regular user um, maintain persistence on the box after the box is rebooted was through com hijacking. So I watched a, a talk by SubT and Enigma at Wild West Hacking Fest last month um, and it got me curious to look at um, uh, where ATP might be vulnerable or other uh, opportunities to hijack com and Windows 10. Um, so after a few hours and a few drinks with them, uh, I found several new com hijacks in Windows 10 which can be used to get various processes to run our malware for us. So what is COM? So for the sake uh, of time, I won't go into too much detail, but, and you can look at James Forshaw's Troopers talk uh, earlier this year, or the Windows Archaeology talk by Casey and Matt, but all you really need to know is that when a process loads, it uses COM to register and reference objects and settings within the Windows registry. Um, so there are several uh, registry hives that you'll probably be familiar with. There's HKey local machine, which only admins and system can write to. And then there's HKey current user, which any user, the current user can write to. And these actually blend um, when you log into Windows. They blend into a, a virtual uh, hive called the HK current root. So um, if we can find instances where COM is loading settings from the current user registry, and those settings don't exist in HK local machine, those will be populated up to HKCR, the okay, current root. So as an unreg unprivileged user, we can register those missing registry keys and have a process run our malicious payload. So in this example, we see um, references to HK current root from various programs and you'll see that, th that those uh, keys weren't found. So that's where using tools like Process Monitor, uh, we can identify these uh, missing com entries and hijack them. So here's a uh, basic script which basically um, creates, uh, defines a new com class ID within current user and defines a com scriptlet URL for the class. Um, so that scriptlet URL that we see at the bottom, attacker slash payload.sct. That's actually just an XML file uh, that contains our payload written in VB or J script. Um, we could also, uh, instead of targeting um, the treat as moniker, we can target stuff like uh, monikers like procserve32 and just have them run a DLL instead. Um, so lots of different uh, keys are vulnerable to this or can be abused by this. And here's a simplified view um, for those that have been in the Windows registry before. We're basically defining our payload and our new class called ACDC, which is by sub -t. And um, then we're filling in that missing registry key, which will be populated up to current uh, root. So um, we're basically saying for this missing key, treat it, treat it as our malicious class and execute our malicious payload. And now when we, even after reboot, various processes are going to load our malicious payload from either HK current user or HK current root. Um, and it'll run our payloads, um, you know, for example, 50 instances of calc when I'm testing. Um, but any medium integrity process that calls this missing com object is going to run our malware for us. And we can create that malware using um, James's .NET to JScript. Uh, or we can just r call a, a malicious DLL instead. Um, the best part of this technique is that you can use it to bypass AMSI because AMSI only triggers on uh, eval or dynamic script creation for Windows scripting host. So all of those improvements to VBScript and JScript um, that ATP relies on for detection aren't triggered. So now we're at a point where we have persistence on the box and we can run whatever we want against the box. Um, let's look at uh, how we can kill ATP altogether after we've managed to um, maybe elevate to admin. 
So um, unlike other antiviruses, we can't just use these common techniques to kill antivirus. Um, a lot of these won't work even as an admin. Um, you could maybe modify file permissions on log files, but that's very noisy and easy to detect. Um, unlike other cloud AV uh, or next gen AV products like CrowdStrike, you can't just uninstall them from an elevated command prompt. Uh, ATP requires an, a generated offboarding script with a SHA-256 signed key based on the unique org ID and certificate. And the reason as an admin you can't stop ATP is because of protected process light. So PPL was a mechanism that came out in Windows 8.1 uh, that transferred many of the security restrictions applied to system processes to user mode processes. So the binary is actually signed by a Windows signing cert uh, and the Windows PPL verification extended key use is in the bottom right there. So after the service is launched as, launched as protected, Windows uses code integrity to not only allow trust, to only allow trusted code to be injected into these processes. So, um, you know, we can't use, say, Mimikatz to inject into LSAS if LSAS is running as a PPL, for example. So, uh, if you want to know more about PPLs, Alex Ionescu covered uh, them extensively in an older blog post, but until now we actually haven't seen PPLs widely implemented at all. Um, there was a PPL bypass for traditional Windows uh, Defender. Um, because Defender can be modified by trusted installer only, basically uh, Project Zero's bypass was to set the um, bin path of trusted installer to stop Windows Defender and delete Windows Defender and then start the service up again. But since uh, release two, they've changed ATP to now run as a Windows PPL protection level instead of an anti-mail or PPL and the process is configured as not stoppable. So we can't use the same technique against ATP. And there's an alert that'll come up if you do try to use it against ATP. Um, so this is, this is a good quote by Matt. Um, it's basically stating that as, as an attacker, you know, we, we have to not only get on a box initially, we have to become admin, and we have to bypass all the logging out there. So as a defender, you have so many opportunities to detect attackers, even if they have admin on a box. Um, you want to watch out for them, you know, blocking Windows event log forwarding and bypassing all those controls we talked about. So um, using some privileged techniques, um, in release two, we can't stop ATP anymore because it's running as a PPL in a protective process, or, or sorry, in, P in release two it wasn't. Uh, now Diagtrack is running as a PPL. And Diagtrack uh, is the service that ATP uses to communicate out to the Windows cloud. So it's the Windows telemetry service. And in, in release two, we could um, just stop that service and prevent uh, anything from connecting out to the cloud. Since then, Microsoft's fixed that and also made uh, uh, the telemetry service a PPL that we can't stop. Um, but they didn't flag it as not stoppable, so we can use that same Windows Defender PPL bypass to stop it by just changing um, the location of its uh, bin file to, to something non-existent. Um, as an admin, we don't have permissions to rename or delete the ATP binaries. However, it is vulnerable to DLL hijacking. So since uh, CNC proxy is just uh, the communication module of ATP, and it's supposed to load the Windows HTTP services DLL from system 32, but it actually checks within its own folder first for that DLL. So as an admin, though we can't um, delete sense proxy exe, we can create DLLs in, in the pro program folder. And so we can uh, you know, either create non-existent DLLs or we can uh, create malicious DLLs in there. And that'll hijack the communication flow because sense proxy is called every five minutes to communicate to the cloud. So if it loads our DLL instead, it won't actually successfully load, and it's just going to uh, crash as we see at the bottom there. Um, another uh, 
way to uh, remove PPL protection from a process. And this wasn't very well documented at all um, in Mimikatz. It was originally uh, created so you could remove PPL protection from uh, LSAS in Windows 10 S. Um, but we can actually use that to remove pro process PPL protection from MS Sense or the ATP e executable and just kill it outright. Um, since then, uh, the Mimikatz driver is now registered as malicious by ATP. So it's actually, when, it's actually a signed driver um, that Benjamin created um, and it loads as uh, Mimi Drive. So we can go into Mimi Drive and we can change what it's loading as. We can, you know, we can say it, it loads as anything we want. The problem is this is a um, signed binary um, and it, it requires a valid kernel uh, EV code signing cert to sign it. So for most people, um, that's out of their realm of possibility because they have to first register a company and then they have to have uh, Microsoft or a EV uh, certificate authority um, do some extended checks to make sure that it's a legitimate company and that you actually work for it. So as, you know, IBM obviously has access to lots of code signing certs, but for the average person, um, not only is it difficult to get one, but it's really hard to avoid att attrition um, because, you know, they can easily see who created that certificate. Uh, it now also alerts on PPL tampering. So if we removed process protection and then the, the service restarted, it's going to uh, flag that. We can get around that um, after MS Sense is killed by just, again, changing uh, the bin path. But there's a lot easier, there's a much better way out there. So we can use uh, James Forshaw's technique to become trusted installer from admin. And then once we're a uh, trusted installer, we can have write permissions to the program files directory and we can just rename ATP's executables to whatever we like. So um, that's a much cleaner way to do it and it won't be flagged by ATP. But my preferred technique is to make Microsoft turn the gun on itself. So here's a snippet from my uh, PowerShell script I put together, it's on my GitHub. Basically, all it does is re resolve all the hosts that Microsoft's communicating, or ATP is communicating to um, in the cloud and just adds a firewall rule to block them. And the great thing about this technique um, is you can also use this to block uh, Windows event log forwarding, to block like Sysmon and SCOM, um, and you can just base it on a port or a service instead of an IP, um, but, but this is an easy way to do it. And I think that's actually the, the best approach because that really can't be fixed. Um, nobody is going to be uh, preventing people from creating uh, firewall rules unless they've specifically done it in group policy. Um, it doesn't require escalating the system to modify file permissions or find a PPL bypass. It doesn't require creating some new signed kernel module. Um, and now that we've blocked ATP and event log forwarding and Sysmon and all that, we really don't care what we've done against the local box. Um, the problem comes when organizations are using other products to manage the firewall, like uh, McAfee HIPS. So if, if that's the, the case, you'd have to use one of the other techniques um, because we can't um, actually modify the firewall rules in that case as easy. So now we're at a point where we can comfortably run commands without being flagged by a local uh, Windows Defender Advanced Threat Protection instance. Let's actually look at the second product um, called Advanced Threat Analytics. It's intended to detect uh, typical Active Directory recon and uh, lateral movement and credential attacks. Um, so a lot of those attacks uh, there that you see, um, it's pretty decent at detecting. Um, this is the architecture. All you really need to know is it's collecting logs off of the domain controller and uh, forwarding them to ATA. In the upcoming version of Azure ATP, uh, or basically advanced threat analytics in the cloud, um, instead of forwarding those logs to a local uh, instance, it's now forwarding them to the Microsoft Cloud at, and it's combining all of the telemetry data from ATP with ATA uh, using the intelligence security graph. 
So this version's not going to be out for three months. I have uh, an invite to the beta right now, but they haven't changed any functionality yet. It's coming in a couple months. And when it does come, it's actually going to be a really formidable solution because uh, you're not only leveraging all that telemetry data from every individual endpoint, um, you're also uh, leveraging security events from domain controllers to, to uh, alert on attacker behavior. And quickly, there's the, the ATA console. Um, that you'd log into, uh, and it shows all the attacks in progress. So um, because it's behavior analytics, it takes a little bit of time to baseline normal behavior, um, especially for abnormal uh, behavior from users. So RDPing to random boxes, um, using DACL abuse to modify sensitive groups, using uh, recon, uh, Obviously, to prevent false positives, it, it needs some learning time. Otherwise, it's not going to be a very useful tool because it's going to be flagging regular user behavior. And so in a lab, when I'm testing this, it's, it's obviously pretty hard for me to simulate a 20,000-person corporate environment in a little lab. But there's basic principles of user behavior analytics that we can stick to to avoid being flagged um, for abnormal user behavior. So as an attacker, we can leverage RDP history, a PowerShell history. We can look at users' bookmarks to make sure that we're only visiting sites we know in the corporate directory that, that they should be. And key, uh, we can use passive um, tools like Wireshark to baseline what activity is on the local network and make sure that we're only targeting those boxes. Um, Tom Porter did a talk on extending Bloodhound. Um, he talked about mapping out connections based on NetStat a couple of weeks ago, which is another great technique. Um, so let's, uh, let's look at um, how we're performing internal network recon. So if you're performing bulk DNS queries or doing NS lookup or trying zone transfers, um, that's going to be flagged. If you try to use things like net user slash domain to get more information about particular user accounts, that's using the SAMR protocol, and that's going to be flagged because that's, that's pretty abnormal for users to be doing that. But not detected is if we use LDAP instead of SAMR. Um, so uh, we can use PowerView to first grab a list of computers and group members which is pretty normal traffic on a domain and really hard to flag, and flagging on this would, would lead to a lot of false positives. We can, this is my preferred technique, and you'll see in this example, we're actually doing WMI queries against the local uh, namespace. So um, this is really interesting because we're gathering all the information about the domain but we're running it against the local box, which has a relatively up-to-date up, up copy of most of the information in, in uh, an Active Directory domain. So none of this traffic's going over the wire. Uh, it's not being run against the domain controller, so it, it's impossible for ATA to flag on that. Um, so you can use WMI commandlets in PowerShell version 2 or SIM commandlets in PowerShell version 3, which are shown. Uh, alternatively, you could use the, the WMI command line. We can also use this method to even see if ATA is in use in the, in the environment. So once we get on a box and we're worried about performing recon against the internal domain, we can first check that this group even exists in the environment. And if this group doesn't exist, we know that ATA 1.8 is not in use in the environment. Um, so we're free to run all the internal enumeration that we want. Um, it's really difficult to prevent this. Um, you'd have to monitor the local security event logs for event ID 4799 uh, and filtering uh, on the security ID not being in the system. So it's, it's really difficult to detect people doing enumeration using this technique. Um, also, uh, tools like User Hunter and Bloodhound, which uses User Hunter. Um, to query servers to find all active SMB sessions, so net, net user session enumeration, to grab all the users and IPs associated with those SMB sessions is going to be caught. So if you've ever used Bloodhound, you'll see how valuable this technique is to most attackers because they can use it to map out exactly who has a session on what box in the domain and then map out the attack path against those users. 
But by default, um, user hunter first queries the DC for a list of domain member computers, which will also include the, all of the domain controllers in the environment. If you run uh, default user hunter or bloodhound against a domain, it's going to be flagged because you enumerated the sessions from the domain controllers. So if we see uh, in the bottom right, uh, it, it's flagging based on against a domain controller. But we can get around this by manually providing a list of computers that don't include the DC. So this was the, this is a much, uh, you know, it takes a long, longer time to go in and edit all of your domain controllers uh, out of that list that you're supplying with computer file flag there. Uh, luckily, the Bloodhound uh, gang um, put out uh, a new version called Sharphound, and they included the flag for me, or for us, called uh, Exclude DC. So now that traffic's no longer going against domain controllers. So when you're running net session enumeration or DACL enumeration, just make sure that you're including the Exclude DC flag. So now that we've gathered info on potential targets such as privileged users, or um, you know, admin workstations. Let's look at how uh, to perform lateral movement against these boxes. So this typically involves um, leveraging uh, the gathered SMB session enumeration, SMP info, or SPN info, sorry, AD group info uh, to target accounts, and then performing remote code execution via techniques or remote exploits to gain access to those other systems and move around the domain and elevate our privileges. So if uh, we're targeting the domain controllers itself, ATA is pretty decent at detecting PSExec and WMyExec against a DC. It may detect due to abnormal user behavior against domain members, so me targeting another workstation or another server in the domain using any of those techniques, because of abnormal behavior. If it sees somebody in marketing going after a key uh, security server, um, that's pretty abnormal because it's never seen anyone from that domain user group in the past go against that box, let alone the user itself. So uh, to avoid that whenever possible, again, we want to leverage um, PowerShell history and RDP history and um, passively monitor the local domain traffic to see what boxes are frequently uh, talked to uh, with users. And then we also want to use session enumeration against these boxes to see who should be logging into these boxes because they already have a valid session there. Um, not detected um, is SBN enumeration and Kerber roasting. So any user, uh, if you're not familiar with it, can enumerate service principal names associated with service accounts. And then they can request their Kerberos TGS ticket, which is encrypted with the account's NTLM hash. Um, requesting uh, these tickets blends in as regular Active Directory traffic. It's really difficult to properly and accurately flag on. And once we have the SPN tickets, we can easily crack uh, them if they're using somewhat weak uh, service passwords with, uh, with something like Hashcat. And so there's uh, Xforces Red's, part of Xforces Red's cluster. I think we have 16 GTX 1080s. So cracking the average SPN maybe takes five minutes. Um, so from a defender point of view, you really want to make sure that any service account that's been registered uh, as an SPN is using extremely complex passwords. So 24 characters in length is the best practice because Hashcat doesn't support that, that many characters right now. Um, and, and making sure that they're extremely complex passwords. If you used uh, managed service account functionality, you can set that as the baseline already and automatically have those service accounts update themselves with, with uh, complex passwords. Um, also not detected uh, is silver tickets. So once we have those SPNs, we can, um, once we have those service accounts, we can just log into the associated server with those credentials and the authentication traffic will never uh, hit the domain controller if we use silver tickets. If we don't use silver tickets, they're going to have service accounts maybe interactively logging into a box and that's going to be pretty easy for 
ATA to flag on um, or other solutions to flag on because they've never seen that service account log into a server as an interactive login, for example. So we can avoid that uh, authentication event altogether by using silver tickets. Um, I'd imagine though with ATP integration coming uh, and ATP can read the local security event logs, that information may eventually hit the, the ATA cloud and they might start alerting on it, but for now um, we're safe using silver tickets to, to only have local authentication events against servers. Um, ATA also detects modification of sensitive groups. So the following is a list of groups that are considered sensitive by ATA. Any user that is a member of these groups is also considered a sensitive account. So if we modify these groups such as adding a member or resetting a me uh, password of a member in these groups, ATA should flag on it. Um, but I haven't run into a single environment that these are the only sensitive or privileged groups in an Active Directory environment. In fact, Microsoft, if we follow their best practice uh, on delegating permissions, suggests that we create a lot more privileged groups with delegated user rights. So if we first uh, use a tool like Bloodhound to um, kind of enumerate what rights groups have in the environment, we can enumerate Active Directory object access control entities or the ACLs for each group or user and use Bloodhound to visualize the attack path. So if we know that we have Abby Edwards' password and we eventually want to get to DNS01, we know that the help desk group has write permissions on DNS admin, which has write permissions on that user count, which has admin to the box. So we can use tools like Bloodhound, instead of using session enumeration, we can use um, DACLs uh, to abuse those. But the problem is, <coughs> excuse me, the problem is if we target um, DNS admins, uh, because it's listed previously as a sensitive group, we're going to get flagged by ATA. So instead, um, we can, um, so if we abuse these access permissions to add ourselves to non-sensitive admin groups, like I sp talked about, and then reset the password of a target account to temporary log into a server such as a user that regularly accesses that box, um, combined with enumerating user sessions on the target server, we can avoid being flagged by ATA for abnormal user beh behavior. Um, by using an account, again, that would be expected to, to log into it. And Active Directory is working as designed here. Um, Abby's account is a member of the help desk, which had delegated control over the web service, which was an admin on Apple One. So it would be very difficult to AT for ATA to accurately detect us abusing these DACL permi pri permissions as long as we're not modifying groups that were in the previous slide. Uh, Rohan, Andy, and Will from Spectre Ops crew recently covered um, a lot of this uh, in the last uh, Bloodhound update. So um, a favored technique um, by attackers is once you have the NTLM hash of a victim, so you get on the box, you run Mimikatz, you get their NTLM hash, and you use that uh, using, say, an overpass the hash attack to request a Kerberos ticket, and you use that Kerberos ticket to log into another box, that's going to be flagged. And the reason for that is you'll see that the alert comes up as either unusual protocol implementation or encryption downgrade. So a Kerberos ticket, when you're requesting it, it actually expects the AES hashes to be included as well. For only including the RC4, which are the NTLM hashes, and uh, that's going to be easily flaggable because it's not regular uh, authentication attempts. So if we include uh, or if we request a Kerberos ticket use, uh, using the AES password as well, or, or sorry, the AES uh, key as well, um, you, you can uh, avoid being flagged. Now, most boxes will only contain the AES 256 key, but I found that um, 
and, and I was really struggling on how to find the AES 128-bit uh, key. And I found if you just use all zeros or any 32 characters, it, it won't flag on it. So as long as you at least have the AES 256 key, uh, you won't get flagged. Um, not detected, again, if we're avoiding uh, uh, domain level authentication events, say by targeting SQL servers, that's not going to be flagged either. Um, because none of those authentication events are making their way back up to the Active Directory. So Nikhil uh, did cover a lot of that in a, in a blog post. Um, but that's, that's definitely a, a great technique is to avoid um, domain level authentication events either with silver tickets or using um, SQL attacks that, that use SQL auth. So once you uh, have access to a privileged user, it's time to use, move towards uh, achieving the primary goals of, say, a red team engagement. So these might include dominance over the network, and you may or may not have to grab the, uh, the Active Directory database or the ntds.dit. Um, it sure comes in handy, but it comes with its own OPSEC challenges that, that you have to risk. So if, if, if you're on engagement and you only need access to specific source code or, or specific file server, maybe you don't have to grab um, the Active Directory database, but it, it, again, it sure comes in handy. Um, so uh, if we're trying to grab the Active Directory database using DC Sync, this has been the preferred method by most people for, for quite a while because DC Sync is so fast and it, it, it's accurate. Um, the problem is um, using this technique is, is really easy to catch because you're effectively impersonating a domain controller from, say, a workstation. So you're, you're saying to active, uh, another domain controller, you're saying, hey, I'm also a DC, send me a copy of the Active Directory database. Well, obviously, uh, that workstation's not a DC, and it's really easy for ATA, ATA to flag. Um, as long as you're running this from the same forest. If you compromised... Um, credentials for another forest and ran the attack from outside of that forest because the trust relationships exist between the two Active Directory forests, that won't be flagged if ATA is not running in the target environment. But there's a lot better ways to, to grab the database instead of DC sync. So um, this is, in 1.8, this is now partially detected, I found. Um, so we can use the WMI uh, Win32 shadow copy class to dump the ntds.data or the Active Directory database via sh uh, volume shadow copy without having to call the volume shadow copy admin executable. Um, but this is now flagged as a low severity event in ATA 1.8, not because we're copying the Active Directory database, but because we tried a uh, lateral movement against a domain controller. So, um, Pretty weird that they're still only flagging that as low, even though we're, we're clearly making a copy of the Active Directory database containing all the users' passwords and whatnot. Um, also not detected is uh, PS remoting with LSAS inject. Um, so via WinRM or PS remoting, we can uh, inject Mimikatz into the LSAS process on a domain controller and grab the credentials uh, from memory. Um, there's lots of ways to harden against this as a blue teamer, though. Uh, we can prevent who has WinRM or PS remoting rights into a box. We can restrict that as something as simple as saying only these specific groups can PS remote in, or only these specific source workstations or IP addresses can PS remote in. Uh, also not detected is PS remoting with raw disk access. So if we connect into a box we can make a copy of the raw underlying file system um, file without starting any services or injecting any processes or elevating the system. Um, you can easily detect this um, using Sysmon uh, for anything injecting into LSAS or on your um, domain controllers in 2012 R2 and up you can set LSAS as a protected process and nothing can inject into it. Um, <clears throat> this, this technique's a little messy though because you're, you're, conf you're grabbing a live copy of the system file 
So because the copy's in use uh, at the time, it, it might, the first attempt, you might get a corrupted file, which you can clean up, or um, you can just request it again and hopefully not get a, a, a version that's corrupt. So now that we have the Active Directory database, what if we wanted to leverage the Kerberos Ticket Granting Ticket Service, or the KRB TGT, to create a golden ticket? So we can come into this environment, um, you know, six months down the line after compromising it to create a golden ticket on any account or any non-existent account. Um, because we're just using the NTLM hash, again, uh, it's going to be flagged as an encryption downgrade because the uh, TGT is expecting uh, the, the AES keys to be in there. But if we, um, uh, again, include the AES keys when we're creating that golden ticket, uh, it won't be flagged. Uh, Microsoft also put in a... Uh, excessive session length um, or excessive ticket um, creation history. Basically, uh, the, if the length of the ticket is, is more than like eight hours and it's used, then it's going to be flagged. So we can get around that by just creating a ticket, using it for 20 minutes, and then destroying the ticket ourselves, and that won't be flagged by ATA. So um, just make sure if you are using a golden ticket, you're, you're destroying it um, after you've used it. So for blue team takeaways, um, you really want to limit PS remoting sources to dedicated admin services, or sorry, admin workstations. Um, you you want to use uh, just enough administration to help prevent lateral movement success. If all the privileged users are only on my admin box and they're hardened, um, it's going to be a lot harder for me to laterally move around the network. You want to harden your SQL servers and your SQL accounts to make sure that it's not easy to perform the same SQL attacks that Nikhil has in his blog post. Um, you really want to make sure that you're using strong uh, service account passwords, especially for your SBN linked service accounts. You want to, uh, ATA gives you the option to integrate SIM and VPN authentication logs uh, into ATA, so definitely do that. Uh, and I think key of all, you want to make sure you're using Windows event log forwarding as a second source of security data. So don't just rely on your Windows Defender ATPs or your CrowdStrikes or your Silences. You want to be running Sysmon. You want to be using Windows event log forwarder to get those logs off the box. So even if I'm able to kill CrowdStrike or ATP or what have you, you still have a second source of all that data and you're selectively sending some of those events off the box to a central file share and alerting on them. Um, you want to use tools like Bloodhound to audit not only um, how easy it would be for a user to move around with net session enumeration, so finding sessions on different servers, but also uh, how easy is it to abuse excess permissions within Active Directory groups. So doing that DACL abuse we talked about to move to different privileged groups. Maybe your help desk user has, our group has way too many permissions to some obscure um, delegated righted group um, that you forgot about. By using Bloodhound, you can audit that all in advance. Um, you can also enforce AES-256 for your SPN accounts, and that way I, I'm not going to be able to crack them. Um, assuming that, that you're still using strong passwords. Um, in Windows 10, 1703 and up, uh, there, a new feature called binary signature policy uh, came in place to help protect PPLs, which basically, again, um, is only signed Microsoft code should be able to inject into some of these PPLs. So as long as you're enforcing binary signature policy, you can, you can help um, prevent that. Um, you also really want to integrate those new Defender branded tools. So that big Windows 10 security stack that we saw with Credential Guard and App Guard and, and Exploit Guard, um, you want to make sure that you're actually leveraging all those tools because they work really well um, if you're properly uh, configuring them and paying attention to them. But even just putting them in audit mode so logs are generated is, is what you at least want to do. And lastly, um, you want to enforce emits or, in Windows 10, Windows Defender Exploit Guard 
um, has these um, rules called the tax surface reduction rules. Very easy to implement. Basically, you're preventing uh, processes like Microsoft Word from creating new processes using, like, say, a macro-based attack. So um, there's no reason why somebody should be launching a document and it launches PowerShell.exe or Command.exe. Um, so using ASR, you can, you can really help prevent that. From a red teamer perspective, we really need to return to living off the land and directly calling APIs. Uh, we want to leverage uh, host-based PowerShell tools like Empire, uh, like PowerUp, et cetera, only after we're confident that we can evade or block ATP uh, and event log forwarding. So uh, even if we are managed to get around um, AT ATP to get on the box initially, again, we have to be cognizant of what we're running against the box and what's going to be picked up by PowerShell event logging or, or uh, Windows uh, script host uh, logging. Um, you want to block Windows event log forwarding right after you're able to block um, ATP or, or other next-gen antivirus to prevent additional logs from getting off the box and flagged uh, on you. Um, you want to use uh, that uh, Active Directory object ab abuse whenever possible to help avoid performing remote code execution on a box. Um, you want to focus on information gathering and lateral movement techniques that don't communicate with domain controllers. So using SQL auth, um, using those silver tickets, and querying the local WMI namespace. Um, you want to curb roast and silver ticket all the things. Uh, SPNs are my favorite target because they're so easy. Any user can request them, and most of the time, you're going to find the odd SPN that, that was registered with, like, password 01, for example. Um, you want to make sure you're using AES keys when you're performing over, over past the hash uh, to generate those curb roast tickets or the golden tickets. Uh, you want to make sure it has AES as well. And you want to abuse forest trust whenever possible um, because ATA is specific to its own forest only. So uh, a big thank you to everyone on this slide uh, and Simon Stellenhag for the permission to use his art. Uh, highly suggest following everyone on that list. They're, they're way smarter than I will ever be. Um, uh, really good people. Uh, the MS ATA and ATP teams have been awesome to work with. They've been quickly patching uh, all the bypasses that I've been finding, uh, and evasions I've been finding. Uh, release 4 uh, is going to come out with a, a lot of patches for the bypass that I found, um, or at least ways to detect them in use. So I'm looking forward to playing with that in the future and finding more bypasses, like a weird cat and mouse game with them, but um, it's, it's been fun for sure. So uh, thank you everyone for your time and for coming out to the talk.